Oh, <laughs> good morning. Uh, pretty close to it anyway. Or good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Whatever time it is you're watching this. Um, I looked, was wanted a little bit of a change of scenery, so I'm on the back porch. Um, listen to the birds, the wind, going through the trees and everything like that. And I thought um, this would be the perfect setting to discuss the second to last topic, uh, which is our, uh, the human reproductive system. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about other systems. Um, and what's interesting about this system is that um, it's the only system that's not essential to the life of the individual. Um, if something were to happen to your reproductive system, um, that wouldn't necessarily be fatal, uh, which I think is kind of interesting. It has, however, has huge effects on other systems, and we're going to talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, and uh, so there's male and female reproductive organs that are, uh, in some cases, very, very different. Uh, the, however, they do share some general similarities. For example, uh, both sets of organs produce and store specialized reproductive cells. And when you combine those cells, uh, male cells and female cells, they create new individuals. They also secrete hormones that play major functions in maintaining normal sexual function, um, developing of sexual character secondary sexual characteristics, and stuff like that. Um, General structures of the reproductive systems include um, uh, gonads that produce gametes, which are reproductive cells, and hormones, the ducts that receive and transport gametes, accessory glands that secrete fluids that are important for um, gametes to move through different systems, um, and the uh, perineal structures that are collectively known as external genitalia, so the outside of the uh, body cavity. We're going to, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we're also talking about the reproductive tract. That's the passages that link the inside to the outside uh, that can get male gametes out, um, allow them access in to meet the female gametes, um, allowing the embryo to get out also. Um, the different reproductive systems are functionally different as well as structurally different. For example, females produce one gamete per month and they are also, their organs are responsible for retaining and nurturing the zygote. That's a kind of a dry term for what the baby is going to turn out to be. Males produce large quantities of gametes and up to half a billion per day and the timeline of when those are produced and how often is also drastically different. So we're going to do this in episodes, I guess you can think about it, um, where we're going to talk about uh, male reproductive system and female reproductive system separately and then we'll have a third video talking about um, function, uh, hormone regulation, we're going to look into that in a little bit more detail, the effects of aging, what happens to your reproductive system as you get older, so on and so forth. There's not a particular order that you need to watch these, just make sure that you watch all three of them uh, by the time you are done. So without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about our first uh, reproductive system. Welcome back. I see I didn't manage to scare you away uh, quite as successfully the first time, so we'll see what we can do with this next one. In this particular video, we're going to go ahead and talk about the male reproductive system. Uh, you may have already watched the female reproductive system video, or perhaps this is your first one. Um, so we'll start with the external anatomy. Um, if I can get, there we go. Okay, so. Uh, the One of the important parts we have are the testes, that's the male gonad. Uh, they are responsible for gamete production, which is known as the sperm, and also secretion of male sex hormones, known as androgens. Uh, one of the things that we're going to look at is the overall pathway of the sperm. And so a, a, an overview 
is we start with the uh, with the testes right in here. And then from there, there's another tube called the epididymis. So we're going to move up into here. And that travels up here through the ductus deferens. We're going to sloop around. You can't really see it over here in this picture. We're going to go through the ejaculatory duct right here. And then we're going to flow into the urethra and then out. So it does kind of a loop sort of thing. Uh, going back to the testes, which are these structures right here. Uh, they're small, about 5 centimeters long, 3 centimeters wide, uh, weigh 10 to 15 grams. Uh, they are enclosed in a uh, sac called the scrotum, which is a, uh, suspended inferior to the perineum. Um, so inferior is below. The perineum is uh, this region right here, basically. Uh, it's anterior to the anus, which is back here. You can't see it on your screen. So that means it's forward, right? And posterior to the base of the penis. And so you can see here's the, um, here's the base right here. And so the uh, testes are actually um, a little bit behind that, okay? So... Uh, accessory glands that we kind of mentioned at the intro uh, that are important. There are three, the seminal glands, the prostate, which is right here, and the bulbourethral gland. It's kind of hard to see that. It's that tiny little thing. Kind of looks like a, uh, uh, like a medicine dropper tube. Uh, other structures that are important to discuss are the dartos muscle, which is a layer of smooth muscle um, in the dermis of the scrotum. So that's that layer underneath the actual visible skin, uh, which causes the characteristic wrinkling. And then the crimaster, which is a layer of skeletal muscle deep to the dermis. So it's actually below that. Um, that is... Uh, responsible for changing the elevation, I guess, uh, that'll pull the, the testes closer to the body uh, in response to uh, arousal or changes in temperature, for example. And one of the things we're going to talk about is why uh, testes are outside of the body and why that's important for sperm. Uh, looking at other parts, we've got the what's known as the spermatic cord, which is this uh, structure right here. You can kind of see it a little bit better enclosed right there. Um, it's basically a tube that has a bunch of other tubes in it. It extends from the abdominal pelvic cavity. So that's, uh, you can see right here, there's actually a hole there, which is the superficial inguinal ring. That's an opening in that um, tissue that separates those cavities, right? Uh, there's uh, layers of fascia and muscle that enclose the ductus deferens, which is this tube responsible for sperm movement. The um, Blood vessels and other nerves like the deferential artery and the uh, testicular artery that provide blood flow to those regions. The nerves and lymphatic vessels um, that uh, provide sensation and drainage and stuff like that. Uh, we also have the, uh, in addition to other um, vessels that drain into the testes, we also have the... Um, the pampiniform plexus of the testicular vein. Let me see if I can find that one. Let me write it for you. Pampiniform plexus. Um, several nerves that go into this area, making it very sensitive. Um, something that's Interesting to note that a disorder that uh, is very common are inguinal hernias. Which are uh, protrusions of tissue in this cavity right here into this 
inguinal canal through that inguinal ring. Um, the, it's fairly common, and the problem is this is a weak point right here that allows that tissue all up here to force its way down in here. Um, uncomfortable to say the least, easily to um, easy to fix. Moving on to the outside, then, is the... Um, the scrotum itself is divided into two changers by the raphe of scrotum, which is this thickened uh, bit of tissue right here that extends up there. Okay, um, e so each each actual gonad, each testy, li lives sits in its own um, cavity, and you can see the lining of that cavity right here around the uh, around the testy. Uh, around all of that is the tunica vaginalis, um, which is a layer that surrounds the, um, that lines the, uh, scrotal cavity. It reduces friction, um, between the different surfaces and stuff like that. And there's two layers, a parietal layer, which is the outer layer, and a visceral layer, which is the inner layer. Um... Let's see, the dartos muscle that we had mentioned. So here's, a, here's another picture. The dartos muscle is this lining right in here. Um, and then the cremaster we talked about, here's that uh, muscle layer right there. Moving on. Okay, so here's why that uh, cremaster muscle is so important. Uh, normal sperm development requires temperatures lower than body temperature, about one degree lower than body temperature. It's too, um, it can't be too warm. Body temperature is too high. And that's actually one of the reasons why um, uh, tight fitting clothing. Um, Overly warm showers, baths, hot tubs, stuff like that can actually be bad for sperm production because the internal temperature gets too high and that impairs normal function. Uh, those muscles will actually relax or contract to move the, the testicles that are usually hanging. will either bring them up or lower them back down based on um, temperature needs to make sure that they uh, maintain a acceptable temperatures. Uh, so we're talking about gross anatomy now of the testes. We have the, uh, so moving inward from the uh, tunica vaginalis, we have the tunica albiginia, which is this section right in here, this whole lining. And uh, it's a dense layer of connective tissue that are uh, support blood vessels and lymph vessels of the testes and the efferent ductules. Those are the ones that are uh, the structures leaving the testes. Um, uh, the actual tissues of the testes, there is a, a septa, uh, which is a plural for septum. It's basically just a, a divider, right? that divides the testes into different chambers. So here are those septa right there, called the septa testes, uh, uh, relatively easy to remember. Um, each lobe, if you look, it's kind of like a knot of uh, rope that's all coiled together. Uh, each one is about 80 centimeters long, um, and the whole testy all put together, all the tubules, it's about half a mile of tubing in there. Um, crammed in those teeny tiny spaces. Uh, they connect to the reet testes, which is this network of tubules here, um, kind of like the glomerulus in the kidneys, okay, but uh, different function. It just kind of looks like the same thing. And then from there, you have the efferent ductules, which are, let me make this go away, which are these structures right here that will eventually connect to the rest of the outside world uh, to the epididymis, which is going to be coming up here soon. Not yet. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so the testes produce immobile sperm that are not yet capable of fertile fertilization yet. They're going to get activated later from other parts of the um, 
other parts of the the system. They're also going to provide nourishment, storage, and storage and transport. So the initial formation happens in the testes, but the sort of activation happens later. Um, they're moved since they can't move on their own by cilia in the efferent ductules to the epididymis, where a lot of this. So they're little hairs that sort of move them along, similar to the, what the cilia in your nose and your nasal passages do to move mucus along. Okay, um, same basic principle. Moving outside of the testes, we have the epididymis. Uh, the epididymis is the uh, start of the male reproductive tract. Remember, the tracts are those ductworks that move things around from the inside to the outside. It's a coiled tube. Um, oh, I lost my lost my screen. Let me go back for just a second. Okay, so um, here's the epididymis right here, this whole section, right? Um, and so it's a coiled tube almost seven meters long that's bound to the posterior border, so the back border of the testy um, right here. You can see it, it. So it's basically attached right there in the orange. And it's got three parts. It's got a head, it's got a body and it's got a tail. The head is the largest part. Um, this section right here, okay, uh, and that's where the the sperm is re first received by the efferent ductules. Then it moves into the body, which is this section right here, and that's responsible for transporting the sperm farther along. And then it gets to the tail, which is this section right here. Uh, that uh, is the primary storage location of the sperm and will ascend to the ductus deferens, which is this tube right here. The major functions of the epididymis are to monitor and adjust the composition of uh, fluids, to recycle damaged sperm, to store sperm and facilitate functional maturation. Uh, moving outside of that, then we get to the ductus deferens. So if we're reviewing, the epididymis is, here's the head, here's the body, here's the tail. Now we're getting into the ductus deferens, which is this tool, this tube, all right there. It's 40 to 45 centimeters long. It's part of the spermatic cord, and it begins at the tail of the epididymis, extends through the inguinal canal um, and you can you can't really see it it's not labeled on this picture very well but it's basically it's going to travel through this section right here into the actual body cavity so this part right here is the body cavity um, it has thick layers of smooth muscle that are lined by epithelials that allow peristaltic contractions to move up uh, away from the testes and it can store sperm for um, several months if it stays in a low metabolic state so not a whole lot of stuff going on from there we're gonna go uh, around past the bladder kind of hook up underneath it and we're gonna get to the urethra now in males the urethra is really really long it's this whole thing right here. Now part of it is also the bladder drains into it and so we have a shared, in males it's a shared urogenital opening. Urine and sperm are going to end up going through the same places. In females it's not like that and we'll look at that later or you've already looked at that, whatever. Uh, it's uh, So urethra is in males, 18 to 20 centimeters long. Um, it goes from the bladder make this go away again. So it goes from the bladder right here to the tip of the penis right there. Um, it's divided into three regions. The prostatic region, which is right here. Let me get a different color. So the prostatic region, because it goes with the prostate. Um, the membranous urethra, which is right here. And then the spongy urethra, which is this part here at the end. So far, so good, hopefully. Um, well, if not, we're recording. You can take a break. That's fine. Uh, a little bit more detail about this accessory glands that we had talked about before. 
Remember, we got three of them in males. We have the seminal glands, we have the bulbo-urethral glands, and we have the prostate. Uh, the seminal glands are these little structures right there, about 15 centimeters long, with side branches. Um, they are tubular glands. That just refers to the, the shape of them, so they're like tubes. Uh, they're folded on top of themselves and compacted. So this is a cross section right here. So it's just a bunch of curvy tubing pathways that are sort of smished on top of each other. Uh, they're very, very active. Their main function, um, here is a uh, histological view and you can see all of those spaces where all those tubes are and how tightly compact they are together. Uh, their main function is to produce the majority of the fluid um, that eventually comes out is sem um, semen. It's you know, helpfully known as seminal fluid. Moving on to the uh, other glands, in between those from the uh, seminal gland to the urethra in here within the prostate is this little section right here which is known as the ejaculatory duct. It's a short pathway, about two centimeters long. Um, it penetrates the wall of the process. It actually goes into it. Um, its function is to mix sperm from the ampulla of ductus, which is uh, this part right here, and uh, fluid secreted with the seminal gland. So it's a mixing joint, kind of like the, if we think back to the digestive system, how the uh, duodenum is primarily a mixing uh, chamber for the small intestines. So the ejaculatory duct has the same function. Once we have pushed fluid and we've done mixing from the ampulla of ductus deferens into the actual prostate and the uh, uh, prostatic urethra, um, uh, we go into the prostate, which is a small muscular organ, about four centimeters, so it's about the size of um, a grape or so. Uh, it ins completely encircles the uh, urethra, and uh, it secretes an enzyme where sperm is actually uh, activated. So you've got all of this glandular tissue right here that will actually secrete enzymes that activate... sperm. That was awful. I apologize. Let's try this again. Um, it's going to produce something called uh, prostatic or prostatic fluid, which is slightly acidic. Um, it's going to form about 25% of the seminal volume, and it is primarily responsible for providing nutrients. Uh, in the form of fructose, because it's easily absorbed by the sperm. We're going to look later and see why that's important. Sperm are very, very interesting-looking, unique cells structurally. Um, they can't do a lot of things that normal cells can do. Um, the prostatic, uh, it also produces... Um, Hold on. Okay, I apologize. We're going to back up because we still need to talk about the bulbo urethral gland, which is uh, these little glands. Man, one of these days. There we go. Right here that are just outside of the prostate. Uh, prostate. They're 10 millimeters. They're super duper tiny. Uh, located at the base of the penis. Their primary function is to secrete thick alkaline mucus. Alkaline is slightly basic. Okay. Uh, it helps neutralize urinary acids in urea in the urethra because urea is slightly um, acidic with some of the, all the stuff that's being pushed in there. It's not really a healthy place for um, sperm, so we're going to neutralize that, bring it back up to seven. Um, and it also helps, uh, it provides lubrication um, to allow stuff come out. I apologize, the trains are moving through like crazy. Uh, the duct of each gland will travel alongside the spongy urethra and empty into the urethral lumen. The lumen is just, that's the inside of the urethra, okay? Um, all of this is going to serve to create um, 
what we call uh, semen. Semen is a mixture of things that contain sperm, of course. The seminal fluid, um, which was created by the... Okay, so I apologize for that. Semen has sperm, has seminal fluid. It also has uh, a cocktail of enzymes like uh, a protease, seminal plasmin, which is an antibiotic protein, just to make sure everything is... Uh, healthy and clean and stuff like that. Prostatic enzyme, which is responsible for thinning the semen, that's gonna allow the sperm um, greater ease in movement. Um, and fibrinolysin, which is actually going to, um, it's part of the formation of uh, plug formation, basically, um, after intercourse has taken place. Um, between males and females, uh, basically to help the sperm as much as possible to get to the egg. Something that's interesting from an evolutionary perspective is a lot of these things that we're gonna talk about in the male and the female, unless you've already listened to that one, um, are structures to try to, in some cases, get sperm and egg together, uh, but in also in other cases, in the, especially in the female digest, uh, reproductive system, there are structures in place to prevent sperm, make it more difficult, almost like a survival of the fittest sort of thing. But it, it's kind of hard to project onto that sort of thing. Uh, let's see, what else What else we need to talk about? Okay, so typically, uh, semen, that's what comes out. It's also known as ejaculate, okay? Um, so a typical, excuse me, ejaculation is two to five milliliters, not a whole lot. Um, if it's abnormally low volume, not a whole lot's coming out, that could be indicate problems with the prostate or seminal glands. You're not producing enough fluid. Uh, something else that's measured is something known as sperm count. So 36 hours after abstinence, uh, your sperm, a sperm sample is collected. Normal range is 20 to 100 million sperm per milliliter. So if you go from two to five, we're looking from anywhere from, um, 40 to 500 million um, sperm. Uh, if you have lower numbers than that, that's gonna make conception, uh, actually bringing uh, a baby into this world, significantly more difficult. Um, so health considerations to sort of keep in, uh, keep in mind. Seminal fluid, talking a little bit more about that, has the same osmotic concentration as blood plasma. So that means it has a the same amount of stuff, roughly, but the stuff is different, the different composition. Um, there's high concentrations of fructose, which is easily metabolized by the sperm. That's the nutrients that we had talked about that the prostate comes out with. Um, it also produces structures called, or um, uh, substances called prostaglandins, which stimulate smooth muscle contractions in male and female. And those smooth muscle contractions are going to help move sperm along. In males, it's going to help get them out. In females, it's going to help get it in to where the baby is, um, high up into the female reproductive tract. Uh, it also produces fibrinogen, which helps perform, perform temporary clots in the vagina. It's a plug, and it's going to keep the sperm up to facilitate um, fertilization. That's ultimately remember the reproductive system is about um, perpetuating the human species and so we're going to have structures and chemicals in place to try to maximize the chances that fertilization is going to happen um, secretions are slightly alkaline um, the prostate is uh, slightly acidic right it's shared your genital opening the vagina in the female system is also slightly acidic and so this is going to neutralize those and make it more hospitable for the sperm i guess you could say um let's see moving on to other parts the actual uh penis is a tubular organ which extends um let's see the distal portion of the urethra so the end part of the urethra um, is going to extend through here. It also conducts urine to the exterior so that again a shared urogenital opening. Uro for urinary, genital for reproductive. Um, and it is also the primary vehicle to introduce sperm into a female 
for fertilization to take place. There's three parts. There is the root. Um, where is, do, 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 do. it is, okay, it's not labeled on here that I can tell. So it's this section right here. It's a fixed portion that attaches the penis to the body cavity wall. And so you can, the body cavity wall would be right here, just inside of the pelvis. So here's your pelvis bone, right? Here's the ischium. Um, the pubic, the symphysis, that's that juncture between the two halves, okay? Um, and uh, you actually have attachment sort of linking off of that symphysis. The body of the penis is the main part right here, uh, which is the tubular movable portion. You could also describe it at that. And then the glands of the penis, uh, also known as the head, um, that's the expanded distal end that surrounds the external urethral orifice. That's the opening where the uh, semen and the urine comes out. Uh, in many cases, um, uh, you'll see it in babies. There is a structure known as the foreskin, also known as the prepuce. It's the skin that surrounds the tip of the penis, uh, like a sheath, I guess you could say. Um, and it attaches to the neck and it continues over the glands of the penis. Within that uh, foreskin or prepuce or prepucial glands um, that secrete a waxy material that supports uh, bacteria. Now, healthy bacteria. Um, but bacteria all the same. A very, very common procedure in many parts of the world is a procedure known as circumcision, where the foreskin is actually removed. Now, there are a lot of cases where it can prevent infections and penile cancer, um, but, and it's, 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 it's interesting. I highly recommend if you have time, look into it. There's a lot of controversy that comes with circumcision. Um, there are certain medical professionals that insist that it's not medically necessary. Um, but definitely, and one thing that I noticed when I was making this is the images. Um, those are all of anatomy after circumcision has taken place. We don't actually, I don't have any images available that I was using of this to show diagrammatically what the foreskin looked like. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting looking at um, sort of the ethics of some of the decisions that we make and stuff like that. Unfortunately, we don't have time to really get into it here, but I recommend, um, you know, something to, something to look into. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? So uh, within the penis itself, we have special types of tissue called erectile tissue, and they're found in the body of the penis so it's this section right here okay um, and some of it actually extends down into the glands uh, it's a dense network of elastic fibers that is encircle the um, internal structures of the penis there's a network of vascular channels that um, will based on blood flow adjust the rigidity of the penis. In the resting state, the branches are, uh, and the network is uh, constricted, and the, the uh, blood flow is restricted. During an erection, those channels are gonna open up, allowing blood to flow into those, um, which is gonna make it stiff and upright. The two types of erectile tissue are the corpus spongiosum and the corpus cavernosa. So here's a different, this is a cross-sectional view. Um, the corpus cavernosum is uh, this stuff right here. Okay, this dark, like purplish tissue in the picture. Um, it's underneath the anterior surface um, it's separated by a thin septum right here, and it um, diverges at the um, it diverges at the base. I mean, I'm going to go back and see if it's 
uh, forming what's called the cruce of the penis. So you can see it, you can see the diverging right here at going into the root uh, of the penis, which is up here in this section. Um, and extends down into the neck right here. Uh, and each tissue is surrounded by a central artery. Let me go back to my other picture. Right here. Uh, also known as the deep artery of the penis. Then the other tissue is the red tissue known as the corpus spongiosum. Let me look at... Okay, that's fine. Uh, it's relatively slender. It completely surrounds the spongy urethra of the uh, end of the penis. Um, and it, uh, it is fed by two smaller avenues. Uh, smaller arteries and it's also uh, responsible for control of uh, the opening of the spongy urethra so stuff can't back up uh, we don't want bacteria and other things backing up that can cause a lot of problems um, later on down the line okay so uh, we're moving right along we've talked about the anatomy overall of stuff now what we want to do is we want to talk about the um, actual process of sperm production. The process of sperm production is known as spermatogenesis. Um, it begins at puberty and it can continue past the age of 70. Males are reproductively active for far longer than women are. The whole process from beginning to end takes about 64 days and it involves three steps. First step is mitosis, that's just regular cell division. Meiosis is the actual um, formation of um, the gametes, the haploid gametes, and then the finalization of the process is spermiogenesis. Um, I'm not going to go into a any really any detail about the specific steps of mitosis and meiosis if you're not familiar with those i would recommend going back and reviewing those processes you talked about it when you were a freshman there's a ton of material out there to try to find it um if you need help with some of it let me know so uh basically what we have is this process of spermatogenesis creating the actual sperm so we're going to have cells known as spermatogonia. So the singular form is spermatogonium. More than one spermatogonium is a spermatogonia. And so a spermatogonia is going to divide by mitosis into daughter cells. Okay, One daughter cell is going to stay a spermatogonium to allow the process to continue. Because then this one is going to divide into... And one is going to go through this process, and one is going to stay the same, and we're just going to keep going. Okay. Uh, the other one is going to differentiate into something known as a primary spermatocyte. And it's, right now, it's diploid. That means it's got two copies of all of the chromosome. Okay. From there, we're going to move into um, meiosis. The primary spermatocyte right here is going to go through... Um, meiosis 1 and it's going to turn into secondary spermatocytes. So right now we're not really diverging any differently from regular um, meiosis. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, the secondary spermatocyte, spermatocytes are going to go through meiosis 2 to turn into spermatid. Now they're haploid at this point and so they're basically like protosperm. Okay, they're not sperm yet. These are immature gametes. They're going to differentiate into sperm through that process of spermiogenesis. Okay, um, from here the sperm, after they differentiate, they're going to lose contact with the seminiferous tubule wall um, and enter fluid in the lumen to be able to move out. Now the the uh, other daughter cells up here that didn't differentiate, they're going to stay in the wall, embedded in the wall, basically, uh, to continue this process. Um, so the actual process of spermiogenesis, that's the differentiation of the sperm. 
Um, each spermatid right here is going to differentiate into an actual sperm right here. Uh, and if you can see by the pictures, there's major structural changes that are going to take place. Um, we're going to actually shed mass, basically, and this is going to eventually get reabsorbed by other cells that we're going to mention here in just a second. Uh, we're going to have a massive buildup of mitochondria, um, and those are actually going to align themselves in a column right here, and we're going to develop a flagellum that's going to elongate. We're going to have something called an acrosome, which is kind of like a cap that's going to go around the nucleus, basically. And so this is our, your actual sperm. Once you've created this, now keep in mind this is all happening within the testes themselves. They're going to leave the testes. They're going to go into the epididymis. Um, we've got mature sperm, but they're immobile. They can't move yet, remember. They get activated later in the prostate. Um, they, this process of activation is known as capacitation. And there's two steps. The first step is the sperm become motile. Now, something that's interesting, okay? We wanna, we wanna keep something in mind. Motile is you can move on your own. Uh, a lot of people get that confused with mobile, which means can be moved. That stinking train again different train same problem is mobile it is able to be moved it's not till the engine is engaged that it is motile it is able to move under its own power okay so sperm becomes motile when it mixes with the secretions released by the seminal glands and then um, the sperm becomes capable of fertilization. And then at that point, it is shunted down the ducts to do what evolution, evolution says it's supposed to do. Um, and when it's exposed to the female reproductive tract, um, then it's able for fertilization. So until that actually happens, the sperm hasn't fully activated yet. Um, here's another diagrams showing some of those structural differences. Um, you can divide sperm into three different parts, okay? You've got the um, head, which is right here, and it's flattened down considerably um, at this point. So it's basically just a nucleus with chromosomes, and that acrosome replaces that cytoplasm, because we've pretty much shed everything else at this point. Um, it's a uh, can, the acrosome contains enzymes that are essential to fertilization. Um, the egg, not just any old cell, can come into a female's egg. It has to be, uh, these enzymes help that process take place. Um, the middle piece, which is uh, right in here, is attached to the head by a very short neck. There's a spiral of mitochondria that provide ATP to the tail, which is the end part. Um, it's the only flagellum found in the human body. Otherwise, we don't have flagella, so it's kind of interesting. Um, it uh, has a corkscrew motion uh, that allows the cell to move from one place to the other. Uh, actual what if the sperm is actually allowed to enter the female reject uh, the reproductive system oh I'm having trouble today that train that train um, once the sperm gets into the female reproductive tract it still has to swim basically to get to the egg um, and so that's where the flagella comes in uh, mature sperm lacks um, a lot of structures. It lacks an endoplasmic reticulum. There's no need for transport at this point. Uh, Golgi apparatus, there's no need to practice anything. And no lysosomes or peroxisomes. The sperm's not gonna last that long anyway, honestly. Um, and any sort of inclusions. The loss of organelles reduces the size and the mass. So sperm cells are really, really tiny compared to other ones. And so they have to resume, absorb nutrients 
so the mitochondria can produce that ATP directly from the surrounding fluid. And their small size um, aids them in that because that surface area to volume ratio thing isn't that big of a deal. Um, okay, so the seminiferous tubules, this is where all this production is taking place, right? So this is kind of what they look like on the inside. Um, a whole bunch of different types of cells going on. We have spermatogonia. Those are the um, eventually going to be the sperm cells. We have spermatocytes at various stages of um, uh, mitosis changing into um, different forms, primary and secondary and stuff like that. Uh, the actual spermatids, which are sort of like pre-sperm, and then the sperm themselves, and then these other cells called nurse cells, okay? And these never leave, but they're super duper important. They're also known as Sertoli cells, um, and they are crucial for uh, spermatogenesis. They have a number of functions, including maintaining something called the blood testes barrier, which is going to be kind of similar to the blood brain barrier. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Supporting mitosis and meiosis, supporting spermiogenesis, um, secretion of inhibin, which is a hormone um, that regulates uh, the production of other hormones um, by the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and secretion of androgen binding proteins. Uh, a little bit about the blood testes barrier. The blood testes barrier uh, isolates semin seminiferous tubules from general circulation, so it keeps... General circulation is the blood and the lymph, okay? Um, the nurse cells maintain this barrier by creating uh, compartments, basically, that don't allow stuff to come out or stuff to come back in. Um, the outer compartment contains the actual spermatogonia, and the internal compartment is where the meiosis and spermiogenesis occurs, and then the sperm enter sort of into the stream. I don't know. That's a terrible analogy. Um, Hormones, a couple of hormones that are responsible for all of this stuff. Uh, the pituitary releases a couple of hormones, FSH and LH, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Something that's interesting is males and females both produce this hormone, um, but how it acts, same hormone, how it acts is, is different. Um, and these are all res released in response to gonadotropin releasing hormone, um, and these are going to stimulate uh, gonad activity, uh, testes in this particular case. The gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, is synthesized in the hypothalamus and is carried to the pituitary. Uh, it's, it's secreted in pulses in both male and females in 16 and 90 minute intervals. So that means every hour to hour and a half, your pituitary is going to go and it's going to release some of this uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, how much and how fast uh, this, the uh, GRH is released, is going to control the production and secretion of follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone. And it's also going to control the rate of secretion of testosterone, which was released in response to the luteinizing hormone. So there's this whole cascade, this hormonal cascade going on uh, uh, of controls. And we briefly talked about that when we did the endocrine system back in December. Um, FSH and testosterone target nurse cells and the seminiferous cells. They're going to secrete inhibit and androgen binding protein, which are going to both promote spermatogenesis, which is that overall process, and the spermiogenesis, which is that finalization of the spermatids. Um, inhibin uh, inhibits the production of FSH production. So we've got a negative feedback, and it also could per prohibit or secrete suppress GnRH secretion. Um, the, so basically it boils down to the more GnRH is produced, the more FSH and LH is produced. Um, here, so the more, if, if this goes up, uh, FSH and LH are both gonna go up, which means uh, testosterone is going to go up, which means inhibin is going to go up, 
which is then going to drive, uh, which is going to cause a reduction in FSH, which is going to cause a reduction in LH, which is going to cause a reduction in testosterone. You get where I'm going with this. Um, sort of a classic negative feedback loop, I guess you could say. Um, luteinizing hormone LH is um, uh, targets endocrine cells of the testes and induces secretion of testosterone and other androgens. Um, testosterone itself uh, has a whole lot of functions. It maintains male sexual function. Um, it acts like uh, many other steroid hormones. This is a sort of classic example of steroids. Uh, it circulates in the bloodstream. It diffuses across target cells and binds to particular receptors, uh, which will actually affect um, how your DNA is interpreted. So we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but basically testosterone is going to trigger the expression of parts of DNA that make males male. Uh, the lack of testosterone is going to cause the DNA to express the f parts that make females females, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, testosterone is going to stimulate spermatogenesis, maintain um, sex drive and other related behaviors like aggression, stimulate bone and muscle growth, um, establish ma and maintain secondary male characteristics, so deeper voice, Adam's apple, hair, increased muscle mass, stuff like that. Uh, it's going to maintain accessory glands and organs of the reproductive system, so lower testosterone can actually see a reduction in those particular organs. Um, well, that brings us to the end of the male reproductive system. Uh, if you have not done so yet, I would recommend going to the female video and then move on to the uh, sexual function, age-related illnesses, and closing statements. If this is your second video, you've already seen the female um, video, go into that third video that I just mentioned that's sexual function, age-related illnesses, and uh, overall hormone control. Um, after that, if you have any questions, send me an email, send me a remind, see me in office hours. Otherwise, um, y'all enjoy the rest of your day.